Women's Silence and Submission Testing Paul's Words in the New Testament It's commonly assumed that Paul is anti-woman as an ancient misogynist of the sorts. Let's remember what Paul was in order to understand Paul's thinking. Paul was a self-proclaimed Pharisee of Pharisees, a Jew from the tribe of Judah. This means that he held dearly onto not only Torah, but the traditions of his forefathers and teachings on the resurrection. This is why Paul focuses so heavily on the resurrection in his writings. Note this, Paul many times will say something is found in the law, when in reality it's found in the prophets or the writings. The reason is likely due to the way the Pharisees would have viewed the inspired writings or prophets. This means that the Pharisees see no contradiction in the prophets versus Torah, but that they expounded on Torah matters, of which I would agree. In other words, when you see the prophet Isaiah or Psalms telling you something that was vague in the Torah, it is still Torah due to the fact that God tells the prophet the information and they write it down for you. It's not adding to the Torah, it's expounding on it. Examples would include, but are not limited to, Exodus 16 and Psalm 78 verse 25, Exodus 33 and Isaiah 63, 8 through 9, 1 Corinthians 14, 21, when Paul quotes that it is found in the law, when really it's found in Isaiah 28 verse 11. So with this in mind, we can now look at what Paul might have meant about women are to remain silent. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Wait a minute. That's not Paul. Hmm. That's Genesis. So, makes you wonder if this might be where Paul got the statement, as it says in the law. So 1 Corinthians 14. Women are to be silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak but must be in submission as the law says. Now let's read that in the King James Version. Let your women be silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also says the law. Now isn't that interesting how the NIV renders this passage versus the King James Version. Now, granted, I'm not loyal to the King James over all translations. You often will see me use the NIV or the ESV or just random translations that seem to have a better understanding of the passage or what makes it easier for you guys to understand when I do these videos. The point that I think is very important here is that you should never just blindly trust any translation. Now, granted, you have your everyday reader, but on these passages where people will launch these at women or these controversial passages, you should absolutely study. And when I say study, I mean cross-reference. You're going to look at multiple passages. You're going to look at before the passage, after the passage. You're going to then look at the Greek. And if you need to, you can look into scholarly commentary. There's a lot of things that scholars can offer you that you may not otherwise find on your own. So, we're going to first look at a few main passages from Paul that people are confused about. Now, some of these on your screen are about submission, and some are about remaining silent. But the main thing seems to be submission. That is the portion that seems to always be repeated here. So as you see, it's 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy 2, Ephesians 5, and Titus 2. Now, I put Titus in there because it's going to become relevant at the end of the study. So first, Paul was speaking to a congregation that obviously had issues they inquired of him about. That's number one. We don't have the writing from that church to Paul to really assess what it is that he's saying. But we know that he's answering something because if you look at his writings, 
he starts off by addressing things as if it has been asked to him to address, right? So this is uh, key number one. Notice he didn't write to all seven churches addressing the same issues. In other words, it was likely because we, again, don't know what the letters to Paul said, that Paul was correcting a local pagan theology that crept into the new congregation, like what we see elsewhere in the Bible with circumcision first argument that Paul had to then correct. Now, Corinth was a large city that had many types of cultures mixing. Think of it as a modern day New York, okay? Read up on it a bit and you will see why uh, Paul might needed to have uh, replied to some of these issues. I mean, it becomes pretty apparent once you know the history. Notice the pattern in all of Paul's writings to all the churches or the people is that the Messiah is the way to salvation as the arm of the Lord. Notice he tells that to every church, all of them, and all of his writings. But what he does not tell to all the churches are that women are to remain silent. Now, this screams that there were issues in the early church in those locations with, quote, pagan women not learning Torah properly and therefore usurping the men. The one thing that we need to also consider here is that they were all very new to Torah and Messiah and needed time to learn everything before any leaders were made or teachings from others in the church came about. In other words, nobody's preaching a sermon until everyone understands the basics, okay? This is how it needs to work. This is why we see in 1 Timothy, one, Paul tells Timothy to oppose false teachers, okay? And then he says, they speak of matters that they do not know. Then in chapter two, he addresses the women issue. Then in chapter three, he tells them to make leaders. So this, this is an order to things. In other words, he's saying, hey, stop the gossip, stop the misinformation, and address the people doing it, and now we're going to set up teachers. So here in 1 Timothy 3, we see in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. This is a, not an office, but a position within the church, the body of leaders or people that would otherwise help to spread the gospel. Now, skipping on down to verse 11, in the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Now, you have had some scholars say that the women here are the women that are married to the deacons. But notice that also the position could be held that the women are also deacons. Now, granted, this chapter is about setting up leaders for the church and the qualifications that they should be, you know, very honest and not indulging in much wine, etc. So if you read Romans 16, this is one of the reasons why I believe this. So it says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincreae. Now, Sincreae is a port city in Corinth. Keep this info in the back of your head as we continue forward with this study. So this is to alert us that Paul was trying to first establish order from chaos with newbie believers, both men and women. Now, as a woman myself, I know that Torah forbids a woman from being a high priest, elder, or something like that. And this is because uh, God is not mean towards women, but that the task of being a high priest, you must be ritually clean for. And women have natural menstrual cycles that might start in the middle of her task. Now, granted, women did perform tasks in the temple of the Lord at the tent of meeting. I personally have no issues with the Lord telling me what I can and can't do. I'm completely fine with that as the Lord knows better than I do. Paul himself credits many women for their help in spreading the good news in Romans, yet never tells all Romans in the letters to them that all women are to remain silent. Here is a snippet I have prepared for questions like these from my notes. Now, you can Google the quote to find the source as I'm not sure where I got it. I 
been studying this for obviously a very long time and don't have the source, so I do apologize for that. Note, this type of woman that you're about to hear about, I would not permit her to speak either. Uh, she's not educated enough yet on biblical ways to stand and speak to others in a congregation. And the same goes for the port city in Ephesus that Paul writes to Timothy about. Here's the quote. Over the years, Corinth became known for its rampant prostitution. A high percentage of populations were slaves, and temple dedicated to Aphrodite, Neptune, and other gods were a huge part of their polytheistic culture. In fact, the Corinthians incorporated sex with their temple slaves into their lives so much that around the world, people began to nickname loose women a Corinthian woman. Ephesus. Much of Ephesus' ancient history is unrecorded and sketchy. What is known is that in the 7th century BC, Ephesus fell under the rule of a Lydian king and became a thriving city where men and women enjoyed equal opportunities. End quote. Now, the worship of Diana was connected to childbearing. Final note here. Ephesians 5 says, Wives, Submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. Looking all of this over, you start to see a pattern within his writings that develops with the churches that were started, which seem to have had power struggles with men and women. Also, that these women were used to temple prostitution. Ergo, they're probably not loving their own husbands or dressing modestly, but rather they're trying to teach on matters that they didn't know. On to the matter of the New Testament Bible verse, which speaks of women, quote, being saved in childbearing. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> women being saved in childbearing is a pointer to Mary via the prophecy of the Messiah because we all know that there will be unsaved women. Women just don't get a free pass because we have a womb and we can bring forth children. These statements cannot be broad brush painted over the entire Bible without its historical context. Again, note this wasn't said to all churches. Noticing again that Paul goes back to the Genesis story of sin. Adam created and Adam did in fact sin on purpose. That's outside the scope of this study. Maybe we can discuss this later. Eve was deceived. She was deceived out of ignorance, meaning she didn't know something. We know that Adam sinned on purpose because God told him directly not to do something and he did it anyway. Now, I have speculated over the years that it was due to being one flesh with the woman when he says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And if he had not sinned intentionally, she would have died without atonement. Adam likely knew that if God kicked only her out of the garden, then she would have no way of bringing forth the line of the Messiah without a man to procreate. Now again, I can explain my reasons why, but that'll have to be a different video. This is likely the reason Paul notes this fact that they, the they, will be saved in childbearing if they remain faithful. The translators assume the they is all women, even though the context of the story that he's referencing back to is Adam and Eve. Now I'm gonna show you the Greek on the screen. If you look, I have some red. Now maybe this is a bit overwhelming, but I'll try and break it down for you. So if you look in uh, 1 Timothy 2 verse 14, it says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now granted, he's speaking of a specific use for the word transgression. Now we don't have this in the Hebrew, we just have it in the Greek. So there are different types of transgressions, especially in the Hebrew. Um, he's specifically stating that the woman Eve was deceived, whereas Adam was not deceived. Therefore, if he sinned, he sinned on purpose. Verse 15, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity, holiness with sobriety or Another word for sobriety would be, that's the King James, would be uh, like sanity of cognitive mind. If you're doing this purposeful, 
So what's up here? Uh, all of these reference back to the Messiah as God's salvation plan for the world, as Paul speaks of in Ephesians 5. Now, I know that I keep bouncing around. I'm in Timothy, then I'm in uh, Ephesians, but that's really the best way to study. Once you start to see a pattern, your mind will be triggered. You, oh, I remember reading that over here. And then when you read it, the context starts to come together and you see why something is spoken directly to one or two churches, but not all seven. Okay, so the reference here where Paul goes back to the story of Genesis is explaining uh, the context. So we, we don't have to assume that all women are going to be saved in childbearing if right before this, Paul is explicitly explaining that through that line, i.e. the woman, the woman's seed, the Messiah would come. And this is why I reference Ephesians 5. We know that it says in Ephesians 5, Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Okay, and then it says, For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church or body. This is something I'm not disputing. What I'm disputing is whether women have the ability to speak. Because, you know, in that same chapter, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. So there is this mutual beneficial relationship here. So why does it seem like Paul is saying that women are not allowed to speak? Because again, that's what this video is about. It's not about whether your husband is the, quote, head or leader of the household. That's not what I'm disputing at all. And I'm certainly not saying that I think women should be pastors. In fact, let me make it very clear right now that I personally believe that women should not be pastors, not that they can't, but that they shouldn't. There's a reason for this, and it's not because you're not educated, and it's not because um, God dislikes you as a woman. It's simply because God has this umbrella for the family, okay? And he has this, this works perfectly if everyone does their job. If you have someone that's doing too many things, something's going to slack. If you have a wife that is having children, she's the full-time breadwinner of the house, she's the head of the house, she's not gonna be able to perform all of her duties to the best of her abilities. Likewise, if a husband had to do all of those things because a wife passed away, it's just not going to work right, right? If you want everything to work right, this is the order God has established. God never said that women could not teach. God never said that women could not speak. God says that there is a role and an order to things so that it flows perfectly. Again, a hand inside of a glove. Everything meshes together perfectly. Now, women are allowed to have careers. The Proverbs 31 woman she is killing it. I don't know if you've ever read it outside of the church view of a woman, but this woman is an entrepreneur. She is uh, selling things. She's making things. She keeps her home tidy. And because of her, her husband is honored at the gates. It's not because of anything he does solely. It's because of how precious she is that everyone looks at her husband and is like, wow, man, you have an amazing wife. And it's not that she's barefoot in the kitchen, popping out babies with her head down, walking 10 foot behind her husband. Not at all. This woman is a very strong and powerful woman. So can women speak? Let's see. 1 Corinthians 14. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak but they must be in submission as the law says. Now, granted, that's the NIV. Remember the King James says, your women should remain silent in the churches, which takes me back to the point of this video. Paul was addressing the specific type of woman found in Corinthian, i.e. Corinth, and Ephesians, i.e. Ephesus, which is where Timothy was at. So, Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. Now that's going to take us into another controversial topic, which I will not cover in this video. 
but for the sake of this video, let's focus on what I have highlighted. Prophesy. This woman is speaking. She is prophesying and she's doing so in a congregation. Okay. Is Paul writing to the same church two different things? In other words, are all women to remain silent or are they allowed to prophesy? Prophesy, which means to speak what God commands by the Spirit moving on you, to speak about the oracles or even be as a prophet which makes known something hidden or misunderstood. Have we even noticed that this is here or are we so focused on the one-liners that everyone broad brush paints the Bible with? We hurl these at women and we, we do this in a very arrogant way, try to beat women down. Have we forgotten some of the biblical women which did in fact prophesy, which Paul would have been very aware of, such as Deborah and Isaiah's wife, which is directly called a prophetess? Have we forgotten what our Old Testament Tanakh says? Because it's at the point where the one-liners are launched, not to really get down to what does this mean, but as a stab in the gut to a woman. And what is so bad is that Imagine thinking it's okay to hear the gospel preached from a cartoon tomato, but not a real life woman, meaning you sit your children down in front of Veggie Tales, which speaks the gospel, and that is sufficient, but you won't allow a woman to spread the gospel. When Paul, again in Romans, pats women on the back, and, and, and he's very specific. He names them, he calls them deacons, some of them. Uh, of which some of these women like Phoebe came from the very location where Paul is saying, quote, women are not allowed to speak. So it has nothing to do with all women or even all women in the church of Corinth or the church of Ephesus. It has everything to do with a type of woman. Unfortunately, we don't know what type of woman this is. Um, this is possibly a woman who uh, didn't really know the Bible at all. I, I say the Bible, obviously, they didn't have the Bible then, but we have it today, so I'm using normative terms. Um, but this woman was probably uh, very used to her pagan rituals, pagan lifestyle. The only thing that I could say uh, to reference a modern day example would be a, like a, a witch of some sort, a, a self-proclaimed witch or someone that uh, does tarot card readings that comes about, uh, learns about Yeshua Jesus, and then tomorrow she's ready to teach. Absolutely not. This is not how it works. You are not educated enough. This is not to hurt your feelings, but you need to sit and learn the basics, and you need to sit and continue to soak it up before um, I, I believe God gives you your gift within the body. I don't think God just goes, okay, here, let me just make you a teacher today. Now, granted, he can, but it's just not the pattern that we see. We see people have to learn and they go through some testing before God raises them up to do things like Deborah, when he raised her up to, to be a judge. And, you know, this was typically because the men are not doing their jobs. Um, and that's not uncommon. Uh, there, there are a lot of powerful women in the Bible. And I think that we can learn from them. I, I believe both men and women can learn from the powerful women in the Bible. Um, so why am I referencing Titus 2? Let's look at this. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way that they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, uh, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children and to be self-controlled and pure and to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. So the pattern here is that Paul is speaking of dishonoring God with the way that you act and how others see you. He speaks of submission all throughout this so that the order God has established will show that it does in fact work. This is not the promotion of men controlling women, but rather a mutual love that honors both parties. 
And I already mentioned the Proverbs 31 wife, who is a businesswoman who, in my humble opinion, is the queen who protects the king. And I don't mean in a you know manly way she runs off and protects him, but I mean she protects uh, the image of the family by doing what she's supposed to be doing. Um, and because of this, everyone looks at him like, man, you have an amazing wife. Now, women are to be protected, but they're not incapable. Um, a husband needs to see his wife as the most prized possession. And yes, I did just say possession, and I'm okay with that, because I am my husband's most prized possession. Now, I know that's probably a trigger word for a lot of women, but if you think about it, uh, in modern day terms, we often use possessive words to express our love and affection towards the other person. For example, that's my man. That's my husband. These are all possessive words. And you say, yeah, it's my person, but he's not my possession. Well, if you think about it, if it's yours, it's, it's yours. You're using a possessive word to ex explain your affection. So I am okay with being my husband's most prized, quote, possession because that means that I hold a very high place in my husband's heart. Recapping, we see that uh, women, not all women, but the women of these two specific churches were out of order. Uh, they were probably coming in confusing the church. Uh, they needed to be addressed. Uh, we see later that at least one woman uh, Phoebe is called a deacon, and she came from the area that Paul was otherwise telling Timothy and, and Corinthians, etc., that women are not, not allowed to speak, right? So we see that it's not all women, even in those churches, that are not allowed to speak, but that Paul is specifically addressing a type of woman. We see that Paul then says, I need you all to submit. Um, even servants submit, uh, women submit, men submit to your, your bosses and submit to those above you. Why? So that no one will blaspheme God or say that God is wrong because you are walking false advertisement. Okay. And this is why a lot of people turn away from God because of the things that the church, meaning the people, not the building, but what the people do. So the pattern here becomes very clear when you start to see this. Women are allowed to prophesy, but there needs to be an order to things. It's all about order. And men just don't get to throw around these, these verses and these words and saying, you're out of order or you're out of turn. Go back to the kitchen and be quiet, woman. Because that's very arrogant and that's not using the Bible correctly. And you know, I didn't even wanna cover this subject. As a woman, I know it's hurled at me all the time. But I typically just ignore it. It's not something that I feel the need to address too often. But it's a very hot topic right now. So I wanted to at least have my stance. Um, because even people within the Torah community are very confused as to whether women can teach or they can't. Are women allowed to prophesy? Are they not? What's going on and what's the order to things? And so I hope this was a blessing to you guys. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comment section. I'm sure this video is probably going to trigger a lot of people, but just know that I needed to at least get it out there so people knew where I stood. Shalom.